Welcome, everybody, to uh, the last session of uh, several panels that have been extremely enlightening. Uh, a bit of a short course in education and the technology and the engineering of the Apollo era. Uh, this, they will be available, on, yesterday's will be available on C-SPAN and, and uh, others we hope will be able, available to you through the website. My name is John Charles. I'm the scientist in residence here at Space Center Houston. I recently retired from NASA. Uh, after almost 33 years of uh, research, uh, life, life sciences research experience. And despite my appearance, I was not here during Apollo. I wish I had been. I got here as quickly as I could after I finished all my education so I could hang out with guys like this. These gentlemen on this panel <clears throat> continue our, our, uh, our effort to bring you into the 1960s, into the, the uh, engineering decisions and the... Uh, the human challenges and some of the drama that took place uh, in the Apollo program that led up to the successful, the very successful Apollo 11 landing 50 years ago yesterday uh, in 1969. I'm very pleased to be part of, of uh, this process and to, be, have, to have a chance to introduce to you some of the most important and most interesting and uh, most informative and enter entertaining people that you're going to hear from that era. Uh, to my immediate left, uh, Mr. Don Davis, who was an... I'm sorry, Don Travis, yes sir, <laughs> who was involved in tracking and uh, communications uh, for the Apollo program. Uh, to his left, Ed Smith, who was involved in guidance, navigation, and control uh, for the lunar module. Then you may hear us discuss GNC, that's guidance, navigation, and control. And to his left, Mr. Harry Irwin, who was involved in several things, including microwave uh, and laser systems, but he also did some crew systems uh, work inside the spacesuit. And I would like to uh, minimize the amount of talking I do and maximize the amount of talking they do. At the end, we'll have a, a question and answer, a question and answer period. So, uh, with no further ado, uh, Mr. Travis. Thank you, Dr. Charles. I've got to have my cheat notes in front of me, so uh, I can't sit down. Uh, when Chet asked me to look at the challenges associated with developing COM and tracking for Apollo, my immediate reaction was a six-letter word we all know, and I know I fight every day, called wait. But uh, then reality set in. And I realized that, uh, among other things, we designers had to consider things like uh, the severe power and volume limitations that our communication system would have on the Apollo spacecraft, the little matter of communicating over 250,000 miles, the uh, need to determine, all right, how much antenna gain is, is required, the need to determine how to get spherical antenna coverage around the space spacecraft, how much antenna gain do you have to have in the ground station, uh, and uh, what operational frequency band are we going to use, and, and things like that. So it, uh, it was not the trivial matter of just considering uh, what, how much weight can I get in there. The Mercury and Gemini, which was our manned spacecraft experience before uh, uh, Apollo, Use separate comm and tracking systems for every link. That is, voice had its own link, telemetry had its own link, uh, up data, our command data had its link, and tracking had its own link. Well, we couldn't afford that kind of volume and, and weight, so uh, we had to rethink the, the situation. Besides that, for those frequencies, I don't think we could have ever built a ground station antenna that was big enough to communicate over lunar distance. In 1962, and I have to admit, uh, like Dr. Charles did here, that uh, before I got involved in common tracking, uh, the people made a decision. That decision was that we would go with a system that had been developed by JPL for their unmanned deep space probes. Uh, this, by, we would evolve it to satisfy the requirements of Apollo by adding voice and data capability. And so this system became known as the Unified S-Band system. Unified because we were using a single carrier for voice, data, and ranging on the uplink and turning around that ranging signal 
and adding it to voice and data on the downlink. Uh, we also, on the command service module, had a separate transmitter that we used for uh, tel television and uh, uh, playback of recorded data when we were outside a line of sight of a ground station. On the lunar module, we couldn't afford the weight of a separate transmitter, so we time-shared uh, both uh, television and uh, ranging. The, the command service module got the uh, required spherical coverage by placing four omnidirectional antennas at 90 degrees elements in the heat shield. Uh, we also added a high gain antenna for communications at lunar distance. The high gain antenna tracked the signals uh, sent up from the ground station and uh, had two modes of operation. One was called wideband and the other was narrowband. The narrowband one was the one that provided the gain we needed to communicate at lunar distances. The lunar module had two omnidirectional antennas. Uh, we were so far away when we manned the moon that we really had to have the, the steerable antenna for most of the communications. Its high gain was a two-foot dish that we call steerable antenna. The manned spaceflight network had stations around the world, had three primary stations, one at Goldstone, California, one at uh, Canberra, Australia, and one at Madrid, Spain. Those three stations had 85-foot antennas, and the rest of the excuse me, the rest of the stations had 30-foot antenna. Now we did just before Apollo 11 gain access to a 210-foot radio telescope at Parks, Australia, and we used it extensively on Apollo 11 for the TV from the lunar surface. Uh, Goddard Space Flight Center had responsibility for the manned space flight network. So to implement it for Apollo, they added the, the S-band transmitters and receivers. Uh, sub, the voice and data were on subcarriers, so they added the subcarrier modulators and demodulators. And they added uh, data processors. Uh, the design of the ground, uh, the digital systems at the ground station at that time was rudimentary compared to today. The telemetry data commutators, for example, used a large patch panel to route the signals. The data processors that would occupy a fairly large room had all of 64K of memory. Uh, my iPhone 7, which I carry in my pocket, has 500,000 times that amount of memory. So, Think about that. We successfully landed men on the moon six times using ground station computers to, trans to process the data received from the spacecraft and transmit it back to the sp uh, control center and had 64K of memory. Data came back here at all of 2.4 kilobits, too. Uh, the Apollo Unified S-band system was extremely complex. We had never used those modulation techniques before here. So we had to have a way to determine is the spacecraft equipment and the ground equipment compatible? And when we combine them into a communication system, does it meet the mission requirements? So we, and I'm proud to say I was a member of the original project team that did this, established a compatibility and test lab here at JSC. The uh, idea was very simple. We put uh, spacecraft communications equipment in an RF shielded enclosure. We put ground station equipment outside that. We interconnected them with coax cables. Uh, we used attenuators to simulate the spreading loss that occurs as radio waves transmit through space. And uh, we uh, tested Command service module, COM equipment, so several models of it. We tested the lunar module communications equipment there. We tested the in instrument unit on the uh, launch vehicles, uh, S-band transponder there, and lunar communications relay unit. We did two different uh, sets of ground station equipment. And we also tested with the Orion spacecraft, uh, aircraft.
Uh, we also did a number of special tests. For example, uh, about the time of our, our Apollo 11 that we're celebrating now, uh, we had started flying color TV on the command service module, and we wanted to know could we get uh, color TV from the lunar surface, so we did some special tests there to evaluate how to, how to make that happen. And so on Apollo 12 and subs, we did use uh, color TV from the moon. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The electronic system test lab, as that compatibility lab was known, uh, is going to receive a prestigious IEEE award uh, next Saturday. And as, as I said, as a member of the original team, I'm very proud to have been a part of that. The plaque that's going to be hung in Building 44 here at JSC is going to read, on this location in May 1963, the NASA Manned Spacecraft Center began a test program to support the complexities of a new communications design for the Apollo Space Program, a united voice data carrier signal. For the first time, a concept of simultaneous testing of spacecraft and ground communication systems was established in the ESTO to provide high-fidelity high test-as-you-fly capability prior to man's human spaceflight. The final steps that we used in certifying the, the communication system for uh, lunar flights was uh, flight verification. Uh, I was the lead of the communications team, and for each mission, we would meet with the Apollo Spacecraft Program uh, man uh, management team, the flight planners, the flight controllers, and we would plan special tests to the communication system to be done during that mission. Following the mission, we would analyze those tests, the results of those tests. We would also analyze how well the communication system supported the other parts of the mission. We would provide those inputs into the Apollo 90-day uh, report, and then we supplemented the Apollo 90-day report uh, with a final report on calm and tracking. Uh, and for each, when we did have an anomaly, that same team uh, analyzed the, d the data, found the cause of the anomaly, and worked with the program office to ensure that we got it corrected prior to the next mission. So that's a brief summary of what we did, uh, some of the challenges we faced and what we did to achieve the communications that you've seen uh, from Apollo. And I'm proud to say that those tests paid off in such a way that we did have great communications on all the missions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Very interesting and enlightening discussion of, of communications over a quarter of a million miles. I know sometimes my iPhone doesn't work so well from here to home. So this is, this is truly a challenge that, that was uh, accomplished in the, in the 60s. Next we have uh, Mr. Ed Smith, who's going to talk about GNNC, and I told you what that stands for, Guidance, Navigation, and Control uh, of the uh, Lunar Module. Mr. Smith. Hello? Yeah, I got it. Can you hear me? Uh, I would like to start my little story about GNNC in 1963. When I first came aboard uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center, which was May 26th, the last day of Mercury. Uh, I had been a test pilot uh, for several years and I had hoped to be qualified to be an astronaut. It was never going to happen. You're six foot three and 200 pounds. They like their astronauts short and skinny. <laughs> so I gave up on that idea, but I did uh, at least go in to flight crew operations initially because I had many friends who were in the business and were astronauts by that time. And it was almost a collegial atmosphere. Uh, we were all spread out all over the city of Houston at the time. Uh, we had not yet moved it down to the center. That was going to happen in 1964. But I found out that uh, they needed people with flight or flight test experience to uh, participate in simulation studies that were going on uh, 
uh, on West Coast, East Coast, uh, Rockwell, North America at that time, and Grumman. Uh, I was uh, asked to be one of the participants because the flight crew was to totally committed to training and uh, a lot of per uh, public appearances. They had no capability to sustain uh, uh, continued studies in any given areas in simulation. So a couple of us, uh, one was a fellow by the name of Jim Brickle, who was also a classmate of mine at the Naval Academy of 52, and myself, and uh, he had the same problem. He was an astronaut wannabe also. Uh, but we were first assigned uh, to go to Grumman at Bethpage, New York, to try a lunar landing experiment. Uh, this was in uh, June of 1963, and at that time, engineering simulations, real-time simulations, were very, very uh, rudimentary. Uh, they were operated almost completely by analog computers and therefore could not uh, have any sort of time duration more than one or two minutes because they would drift badly. Uh, but we uh, got up there, we understood the Grumman pilots were having a hard time with the simulation. It was a simulation of um, starting at about a thousand feet in altitude over the lunar terrain and about uh, a thousand feet backward for, uh, from the, the target, which was a 50 foot circle. Uh, uh, we uh, did 100, uh, 100 runs each, uh, met the, uh, the problems of uh, getting in the circle very easily and did them in 60 seconds or less. Uh, we left a bunch of Grumman engineers very pleased and they said, come back any time. So we were on the airline, airliner going back to Houston and we're talking about what we saw and what we didn't see. And it begged the question, what happened above and prior to uh, the uh, landing uh, study that we just participated in? And we both chose to go and query the program office of what they were planning that would make us end at 1,000 feet and 1,000 feet to a 50-foot circle. We found out fairly readily uh, the program had set a preliminary baseline where the optimal trajectory was a powered flight that uh, did not uh, account for any pilot visual uh, assessment of the, the lunar terrain prior to that point. It was just going to be a very efficient uh, powered flight and then pop over to an almost vertical position and say, it's yours. Uh, that doesn't read well, uh, and we found out that several other uh, flight crew members had uh, found out about it, and there was a great concern about why uh, they were going to say, uh, you've got t 50, 60 seconds to land. Uh, two of the uh, gentlemen that were interested was Ed White and Jim McDivitt, which I... Uh, knew Ed very well. He was a wonderful quarter miler, a world class, world class quarter miler. Uh, but the, the main point was that we took our case to the uh, system engineering part of the program office and they uh, were not impressed that uh, we felt the need, but they gave us the chance to go and get our act together and uh, state uh, their, our position as flight crew. Uh, it took us about a month and a little uh, flight dynamics work and we came in with an approach that said, give us uh, about two minutes to assess uh, the terrain before we make a decision where to land. And a total of uh, uh, three minutes uh, uh, to a nominal touchdown plus uh, one minute of uh, additional contingencies uh, for anomalies uh, in the environment or uh, uh, drifts in the system. Uh, we found that we had other people 
at the center concern. Uh, uh, two members of the uh, Guidance and Control Co Division, Don Cheatham, who is the uh, Assistant uh, Division Chief, and Clark Hackler, who is a, uh, Assistant Branch Chief there, who had been going almost identically the same approach. And so we kind of combined our uh, expertise and came up with a profile that said, uh, we will uh, let the pilot uh, exert his experience in pilotage, which is understanding the environment and can um, understand where you are with regard to landmarks, either man-made or natural, to guide our, yourself to a desired point. Uh, we uh, put together this reference po profile and the uh, program office tentatively accepted that in 1964. Uh, we started working on that uh, profile and uh, trying to understand the requirements that were necessary for the pilot to have as uh, good a chance as possible to make a success out of this approach and landing. It came out that we were going to uh, pitch him over from this optimal trajectory where he was just coming in feet first and looking up at the, at the sky to pitch him over to a 45 degree angle. And he could see in the bottom 15 uh, uh, degrees of his window, the planned landing site. Upper left hand corner, you see a picture of the astronaut in his standing position uh, where uh, he is tethered to the floor of the, uh, the spacecraft and peering out a triangular window. Uh, the design eye position is about 16 inches from the window, but he could uh, see at the bottom 15 degrees of the window uh, the land, uh, nominal landing site. Uh, right to the right of that uh, picture is the window itself, and we had inscribed on the window, both on the inside window pane and the outside, a set of lubber lines that are uh, having a zero parallel to the, the forward-looking axis of the spacecraft and going down to about 50 degrees or uh, at the bottom in increments of, of two degrees. Uh, what we did was uh, have the guidance computer uh, display, at, once he had pitched over, the intended landing site that he could see by looking at a line of sight on the correct lever line to spot where the computer would land him if they had no modification. With that, uh, he could make decisions whether he wanted to either uh, deviate from that or accept that because the display and keyboard, which I'll show you in a second, uh, would give him that, that, that number. And if he decided to use uh, that number, he just flew it in. But uh, if he didn't, he could use the rotational hand controller in the lower right-hand corner and uh, use it as a uh, guidance, what we call a landing point designator uh, input, uh, LPD, and that uh, he could pitch it forward or aft and shorten the distance or lengthen the distance by a one degree line of sight. Uh, conversely, he'd uh, uh, roll the, the attitude controller and get an uh, off axis line of sight change with the LPD. So uh, that was the first requirement we had to ease the pilot's uh, job of, of uh, making a successful approach. The second thing we did, uh, did it again, sorry, going the wrong way. The second thing we did was to afford him an easy way of controlling as he neared the landing point. Uh, and he has uh, cross pointers 
on the left hand side that gave him the two horizontal components of his velocity and then a set of, of uh, uh, tapes uh, showing him altitude and altitude rate just to the right of the, uh, the eight ball that you see in the middle. Uh, those were the, the main tools of making his navigation decisions. Uh, and then when he decided to make his decision to land, um, uh, he had a, a little uh, spring-loaded two-position switch uh, called the Rate of Descent Command, which is shown there, that, that allowed him to control the descent rate uh, by one foot per second increments. And the uh, uh, control system would maintain that given uh, descent rate that he had commanded, and uh, it was very, uh, very uh, powerful tool to make him, allow him to assess the terrain while knowing that he, his uh, descent rate is very stable. Okay. There is the uh, display and keyboard in the middle, uh, which was uh, the out input output for the uh, uh, primary navigation and guidance system, uh, we call it the DISCI, the display and keyboard. And it was uh, very uh, important to understanding the health and well-being of the, of the um, uh, PINGS, the primary guidance system. So now I can turn this thing off, I think. Come on. There. Once we had this in place, uh, uh, it was obvious that, to me that I was uh, kind of dead-ended at flight crew operations. And fortunately, I got an invitation from Mr. Cheatham to come join guidance and control. So I was a bona fide member of the engineering group and not uh, quite so outside the, the club at that point. Uh, uh, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Dave Gilbert, who was probably one of the best uh, and most knowledgeable in fly-by-wire systems at the time. And uh, he had done the F-102 and F-106 uh, flight control and uh, weapons control systems, so he had a mouth of uh, experience. So we started out, and this was 1965, uh, building uh, what was to be the, these uh, tools uh, that uh, would help the uh, pilot complete his uh, mission successfully. Uh, we did everything from uh, simulations to uh, determine uh, the uh, uh, abort uh, sequence that you would need and what altitude you would need to be, be able to safely abort if we had engine problems, the quantization levels for the displays, uh, practically everything that you could go bad, we tried to work on. And uh, we, we spent two good years uh, uh, playing that game. And then at that point, why uh, we were ready for Apollo 7, 8, and uh, then the MINTS, the flight testing of the uh, LIM in Apollo 9 in Earth orbit. Uh, by that time, we felt that we had uh, the, the uh, software requirements well uh, defined and integrated, but we, hadn't getting, we weren't getting the flight software for the, the uh, LIM-powered LIM descent yet. So uh, we were guessing a lot on what needed to be done to uh, make sure that the robustness of the approach was satisfactory. We uh, did more to come up with uh, outrageous approaches uh, to loss of sensors to, and abort, make successful aborts uh, uh, to, to back to uh, orbit. And finally, uh, we saw 
the, the success that Apollo 9 and had in Earth orbit and then Apollo 10 in lunar orbit. Uh, finally came down to uh, quiz time, uh, and that was uh, July 16th of 1969. And uh, we had uh, a group together that uh, represented the GNNC uh, group in, um, around a table in uh, uh, the, the uh, engineering su uh, staff support room. Uh, that day, why Saturn made a successful uh, insertion into translunar, and that evening, uh, Ray Wilson, who was the subsystem manager for the GNNC, uh, called me and asked me to come over. It seems like Gremmen had called them, uh, called him, to announce that there might be a problem with the landing radar antenna. It had two positions, and one with called the approach uh, antenna, where it was canted about 25 degrees from uh, the vertical axis, and then the landing uh, orientation, which was uh, parallel to the, the thrust axis. And their concern was that there was a possible uh, possibility that the uh, antenna would not uh, rotate to the landing position, and what, how would that affect the uh, primary guidance and control? So we spent an all-nighter uh, on the uh, limb simulator in building 16, and um, uh, determined that uh, if even if it's stuck, the uh, data that we'd be getting. Uh, both from horizontal position and vertical position was uh, only mildly uh, erroneous, but we needed to make sure that the primary guided system knew about it. And at that time, we had what we call pad loads, which were uh, uh, not, uh, small changes to the flight software that could be s sent up and either uh, inertially uh, put into, uh, excuse me, initially put into the disky by the crew or uploaded. Uh, but we had to get the attention of the flight ops people about the problem. So the next morning, uh, we went to their 7 o'clock status meeting that is chaired by Dr. Kraft and uh, confronted them with the surprise that Grumman had given us. And as you might suspect, it was not well received. Um, we did uh, tell them that we had spent all night and, and tested the pad load and it, it, it appeared to be satisfactory and we gave it to them. Uh, they were not uh, uh, really enthusiastic about it, but Dr. Kraft said, take it and check it out. And with that, we hate, beat a hasty retreat. Uh, that afternoon, Dr. Kraft called and said, uh, Thanks for what you did. We, it works, and we're going to send it up as a pad load. So uh, that was the best attaboy I think I had in that program. Uh, and it set us up for the day where we were going to see the power descent, the, what was called the 60 series programs, uh, do the thing on a first flight. Normally, we think that first flights are something are done uh, in a very controlled environment uh, and uh, very, very uh, carefully uh, test each function one by one so that if we have a failure in flight test, uh, we can revert to the original um, state of the spacecraft air aircraft. In this case, we did not have that knowledge of the environment. It was a pure guesswork by all of us. Uh, we had done the best we could to understand what might uh, occur and what might not. We had worked very hard to uh, test these functions, and especially the new one we found out about a set of alarms that had been put in the flight software, which was called Lunar, Luminary 1A, and uh, it was new to us, and we had found out all about that about 
two months before uh, the actual use of the uh, for the power descent. And we uh, worked very hard to insult the flight computer any way we could. Uh, we, we really tortured it. Uh, we would uh, go to Grumman with their full mission engineering simulator and uh, fly very uh, convoluted uh, missions and punch the interrupt button as much as we could, but we couldn't make any sort of uh, penetration as, as far as uh, bothering the computer. So we came the 20th of, of uh, July, uh, and we were uh, getting ready to uh, uh, undock and uh, start the power descent, uh, the deorbit. We did that successfully, and power descent started. Uh, within five minutes, uh, which we got down to uh, about 40,000 feet, we engaged the landing radar and immediately got a 1201 alarm. And uh, fortunately, in flight ops, uh, Jack Garman had one of the uh, better uh, uh, mission uh, operatives over there had, uh, was aware of the problems uh, that could have been occurring with the 1201 alarm and uh, he heard what we were doing, and he told Steve Bales it was a go, and they took it. And uh, we had four more of those alarms, 1201s and 1202s. And uh, fortunately, the computer uh, uh, swallowed those um, problems and continued its flight, and uh, Neil uh, successfully made his run and uh, used the, and got it a, P-64, which is the first uh, follow-up approach to the uh, landing, and uh, he made one uh, design, landing point designator and then switched uh, to P-66, which is the landing uh, program, and used his radar to set command. Overall, he, he had better than five minutes that he used visually. He ran out of, he was so close to running out of fuel, it was scary. But uh, he made a beautiful descent and put it down, and uh, uh, you all know how it went from there. But I wanted to make you aware of the problems that came up and existed and the, the robustness of the system uh, handled them right smartly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I think it's always interesting when you listen to the replays of Aldrin talking to Armstrong, you can hear him calling out degrees, 32 degrees, and that, those are the numbers that, that Armstrong is looking at through the window to see what the, where the computer is taking him for his landing and how he's, he's maneuvering around. Uh, finally, we have uh, Mr. Harry Irwin, whose uh, expertise is in microwave and laser systems, and he's going to tell us about a little bit of the Apollo experience with those activities, those systems. I, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more of an overview. Mine's not going to be so specific into some, some systems, but I came to the Johnson Space Center in 65, and I was 20 years old. And uh, what I saw was an incredibly organized place. First, we knew exactly what we were trying to do, get them there, get them back. Uh, Kennedy had laid that out so nicely, and everybody from the center director to the person knowing the line you were trying to do, get them there and get them back. The Manned Spacecraft Center, as it was called back then, uh, was organized to do that mission. There were space scientists that looked at space and defined it. They said, this is the pressure, this is the temperature, this is the radiation, this is the gravity out there. Then there were life scientists, basically doctors, who looked at the human body and said, can't stand that pressure can't stand that temperature, can't stand that radiation, can't stand that kind of gravity or microgravity. And then there were the engineers, and that's who we're talking about today, who would say, well, we'll build you a machine that can modify the environment so the human can stand it. And there were flight controllers that said, we'll direct the mission. And then there were astronauts who would actually fly the mission. In a lot of ways, the mission defined the hardware 
but in some ways the hardware actually defined the mission, things that you could actually accomplish. I'm here to t today to talk about the engineers and the challenges of the design, the certification, and the equipment tests to make Apollo possible. Here at JSC, or MSC in those days, uh, we were constantly challenged to find ways to simulate the environments of space. Um, when I first started, there was not a Space Center in Houston. All the tourists came on site, and we had a million a year that would come peeking through our windows and walking through the chambers. It was, it was like being in, inside a fishbowl. But one of the first questions they always ask, I, I worked in chamber operations at first, people would be in there in suits with, with a vacuum. They'd want to know when they were going to float, when they were going to be zero gravity. That was the, one, of the, one of the other speakers talked about that being the hardest thing but we had vacuum chambers to, to test the suits. We had centrifuges to, to give us some acceleration. We had the wet F, which was the, the swimming pool, which is as closest to zero gravity as we could get. We had anechoic chambers, which basically mean no echo. So when a radio wave passes you in space, it doesn't echo off anything and come back. So you have to test it in places where it doesn't echo. We had a laser tunnel, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. We had shake tables where we could put equipment on tables and shake them uh, like the, the rocket would shake it on the way up. Some of the equipment that we first tested just came apart during those shake tables. Well, we also had fun. One, one Christmas, uh, the shake tables were really big speakers. One Christmas, they played Christmas carols on those big speakers and opened the doors. You could hear it all the way over Nassau Bay. Um, uh, we had a solar vacuum chamber. Uh, we, we actually put the entire command and service module with a crew in it, and, and the solar vacuum chamber had solar uh, lamps on one side that looked like the sun and, and liquid nitrogen on the other side that looked like the deep of space. And they did a whole mission profile of rotating in there the time that they would have to take to go to the moon and come back to prove that that spacecraft could stay together in that kind of environment and, and get them back alive. And we had ESTL. Don talked about it a little bit while ago, Electronic Systems Test Lab, and basically it was to make sure that the electronics played nice, that, that one electronic system didn't interfere with the other one. But sometimes all of these things did not, all these uh, test labs didn't satisfy what you needed. I built a thing or worked on a thing called the laser, Apollo laser altimeter. Uh, it was a ranging system that, that used to map the moon for scientific missions and for future landing sites. Um, it was a pulsed ruby laser with a transmitter and receiver optic, so it, it was an extremely simple system. A, a laser pulse was sent down to the moon, and a little bit of that pulse as it left the, the, the transmitter would be bled over to start a counter. The counter would count. When the pulse came back from the moon, it would stop, and they could, you, could, you could look at the counter on the counter and tell how long it took to go down and back. You knew the speed of light, so you could figure out uh, uh, how the range from, you, from the spacecraft down to the surface. Uh, it was very simple, but lasers had only been around for a few years, so it was kind of a challenge. We needed a way to test this system in an environment that was similar to the one that we would be using, which was in 20 to 60 miles of vacuum. So we didn't have a 20-mile vacuum chamber. So the, we did the next best thing. We tested in a, in a high-altitude mountain peaks that were like 26 miles apart. Uh, we chose two mountain peaks in New Mexico above 8,000 feet and had the calm air that wouldn't interfere with the laser transmission and, and, and spoil the test. We had the Army Corps of Engineers prepare the two sites. And one was the site where the Apollo laser altimeter was mounted in a van, and it had all of the equipment you needed to test it. And the other was the, a, a target that was the nominal reflectivity. Uh, among the pieces of equipment in, the, in the, the altimeter site were some telescopes that needed to be lined very precisely with the target. So we needed a way to find the target uh, and lock these scopes up. And I had read somewhere, and I actually wish I had never read it, uh, that you could find things at a distance using smudge pots. So we put a smudge pot on the target side, and, and the Army guys that I was working with uh, lit it off. It produced a column of smoke that could be seen. We were going to home in the, the, the telescopes on that smudge pot and know where the target was. We tried that. It was a disaster. Um, the, the smoke rose to a certain altitude and then was trapped by a temperature inversion. It continued to come up. It continued to stack up until not only we couldn't see the target, we couldn't even see the mountain. Uh, we had turned the whole mountain to light purple. So, so we let that smoke disperse uh, and say we'll try it again. Uh, 
at that time, one of the older guys, and, and everybody there was older than me, one of the older Army guys came up and said, you ever thought about doing this at night and using a flashlight? <laughs> and I said, what a good idea. <laughs> and so we, we did that, and it worked perfectly. Um, it was a little spooky, and maybe that's the reason I wanted to do it in the daytime the first time, because we were looking down at the, uh, the Trinity site. Our mountain peak was looking down at Trinity where they did the first atomic bomb, and I think I'd seen too many scary science fiction movies about monsters rising up out of the ashes. So, but we did that. We aligned the telescopes. The instrumentation was working fine, and the, and the, 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 the test was perfectly successful. Just sort of a side, uh, that site is now part of the Air Force Directed Energy uh, directorate, and, and it's used, uh, they're shooting lasers from peak, peak to peak now, but a whole lot more higher intensity and for, for shooting down incoming missiles. We flew that Apollo laser altimeter on Apollo 15, 16, and 17, and got a lot of great data. Uh, it was mounted on the command service module, in the, in the service module part, a thing called the, the science instrument uh, bay science instrument module. We, on those later Apollo missions, we had a little bit more room for science. We, we had a little bit more weight for carrying the rover around, if you remember. The rover was, was extra weight. We also had the weight to carry some science instruments, and, and my, mine was part of the science. Uh, the altimeter was used with a, uh, two cameras produced by Fairchild Corporation, and they were, the, the way the thing worked was real interesting. These cameras were mounted on rails, and they would slide out so that the, the service module didn't, didn't obscure them. It would take a picture of the lunar surface below, and the laser altimeter would it simultaneously range to the center of that picture. At the same instant, it would take a picture of the star field above, and at the same time, we would get a range data from Don's uh, communications and tracking system. So with a picture of the moon, a picture of the stars, a laser ranger down to the surface of the moon and a range back to Earth, the, the chief investigators back home could make a precise map of the areas that we were flying over. They knew exactly where they were and they knew exactly their attitude. <laughs> One of the things that occurred to me when I was doing this now was how we got the data back to Earth, how things have changed so much, because uh, the data was contained on film, uh, high resolution film back in the service module. There were no, no way to send high definition pictures back here now. So the crew did a deep space EVA. Uh, on, the, on the return part of the mission back to Earth, they opened the door, went back to the service module, and, and gathered the film canisters and returned them to the command module. Uh, they were stowed there for the return to Earth. And I have enough trouble imagining an EVA above the Earth, or, but, but an EVA in, in cislunar space, halfway between the Earth and the Moon, uh, you've you got to be brave to do that. Uh, the command module pilots did that for the last three Apollo missions. Al Warden did it for 15, Ken Mattingly did it for 16, and Ron Evans did it for 17. Um, the film brought to the principal investigators, it was used for science and for mission planning later on, uh, and it was, it was a big success. I want to say one last thing about uh, building systems uh, at, at, at JSC. Uh, teamwork between MOD, the crew, and engineering was fantastic. Uh, on most subsystems, we had a crew member that was part of our team, and they would tell you the, what was going on in terms of developing the hardware from the crew point of view. And I remember uh, John Young was, was the crew member on several of the later uh, subsystems that I built, and he was something. He would, he would give you this good old boy routine. He'd say, I just don't know much about this, but then he would nail you uh, with, with a question about how it had to be done. Uh, and so using MOD, the crew, and, and the engineering directorate to, to put things together, uh, we found ways to design, test, certify equipment to make Apollo possible. Uh, engineering directorate did a lot of it, but we were not alone. En engineering, MOD, and the crew working together actually made it all possible. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Irwin. And now we have time for questions from the audience. Any, any questions for these luminaries, no pun intended, of, of uh, spaceflight uh, mission planning? Questions? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> 
if it relates to spacesuits, that's not really what this panel's for, but we have one of the experts for the spacesuit in the front row, so after the session, why don't we come up front and ask that question again, okay? Uh, okay. Good. Thank you. Oh, I see. Yes, please. Yeah, the question is, uh, were there any accidental discoveries that turned out to be really good ideas and they, they made things successful that might not other, otherwise have been? And that's for anybody uh, that wants to answer it. Well, I can, I can give you one example. It's, it's not exactly uh, along the mission line you were talking about, but I went on to become head of the microwave and laser section here, and the, the whole idea of lasers uh, was intriguing to me, and the whole idea of light-emitting diodes, because it was... a um, I think an accident, the first person that ever discovered the photons coming out of a diode, uh, they, were, they were working with a diode and somebody said, oh my gosh, what's that? Uh, and, and so they, they went on and, and entire industries have come out of that. Uh, uh, it was in a Texas Instruments lab, I believe they were working on something and, and, and had the, the, the diode out in its raw element and just saw, saw light. Uh, and, and, and followed the, in, uh, the investigation as to, you know, what caused it. Uh, I mean, in, in entire, entire books have been written about how it went from there. Yes, please. question relates to the signal dropouts uh, during the descent on Apollo 11, and how is that fixed on subsequent missions? Well, it, let me give you a little background there. And yes, I mean, that was the most intense 12 minutes of my life because there my system was not supporting the mission. <laughs> but it kind of goes with the question about accidents. It turns out that when we went into the anomaly investigation, that a modification had been performed to the lunar module at uh, KSC. Unfortunately, that modification, which was the addition of some RCS thrust uh, deflectors, metallic at that, uh, was not included in our coverage diagrams. And so we were trying to look at the Earth straight through that uh, deflector, and all we were getting was multipath. And the system every six inches or so uh, was changing and losing lock. So we got our coverage documents updated and, and had correct coverage doc documents after that. The question relates to the quote from Neil Armstrong, one small step for man or a man, did the radio compression have anything to do with that disappearing A? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> it, I, I have read uh, more recently that he admitted that he intended to say a man, but uh, and I guess you would say in the excitement of the moment, and I'm surprised he could even speak, uh, you know, he, he forgot the word A. And so what we're hearing is what he actually said. The question relates to the, to the uh, transmission from the moon was picked up in Australia at the tracking station there and uh, the original tapes that contained the original uh, version, uh, the original recorded version of the, uh, of, the, of the TV signal were reused later on. Uh, do you have any, any insights into all that discussion? I, I've 
even as recently as this week, I've heard arguments both ways. Uh, what I do know is that uh, an engineer at Goddard Space Flight Center named Dick Navsker has done a lot of work uh, with the, the film movies that came down. And of course, that was a slow scan TV, so uh, it, it, the signal was coming down at 10 frames a second and then being upgraded to 30 frames a second. And uh, so there's some much improved video available on YouTube today compared to what we saw live that night. Well, that's an interesting uh, variant. Uh, the question relates to the fact that we've, we've been hearing all along that the computers from the 60s are so rudimentary compared to ours. Would increased complexity of the computers in the 60s have helped or hindered the mission? I, I think, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, one of the things that computers do is allow you to get more work done in the same amount of time. And I think uh, technology uh, would have enabled us to make it a much more complex mission, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's, you know, we used what we had available at the time. And uh, for example, I, I told you about the 64 kilobits earlier uh, computers the data came back to the control center at 2.4 kilobits. I don't know about you, but I have 300 megabits per second coming into my home today. It, I think uh, Harry talked about this a little bit. We were a group of young people. I was 30 when we landed on the moon. And uh, we didn't know what we didn't know, but we had great leadership and we were just determined to make it happen and come over, overcome all obstacles, as Ed talked about. Uh, can you hear me? Um, with regard to the computer and the alarms, uh, we had a, a 36 kilowatt computer, hardwired, and with a, about a one uh, kilo, uh, kilowatt read write and uh, so you had a very very constrained set of, of tasks that you could wire into this computer but it was very effective of, of actually uh, uh, governing the tasks to be done uh, well, the one time that we had this experience of uh, a raft of alarms was because uh, of the power sources that were used both in the uh, the uh, abor uh, attitude and translation control assembly, which was one separate power source, and the CDUs, the coupling data units, which was used from the primary source. They're both 28 volt, 800 hertz, but the, only the voltage was was locked together. The, we were not locked in phase, so. Any time that uh, uh, you had two different power sources coming in to a, a, AD, a to D and D to A converter, uh, like the CDUs, it would create a, uh, a task uh, because they're seeing a difference in uh, data. The data would, uh, in the CDUs could come from accelerometers, they could come from uh, gyros, they could also come from the rendezvous radar shaft and trunnion. In this case, the shaft and trunnion of the uh, uh, rendezvous radar were the culprits. And, uh, but the, when they found that uh, they got this mismatch of the uh, phase and uh, the two power sources, it created a uh, task of data uh, increments that were f different from the originals. They're very high priority, so 
the, the computer accepts those, and the executive said, do a, do a work, uh, work job on them. And, but they were getting so many because of the, the, the um, uh, difference in phase that uh, it exceeded the 90% uh, uh, duty cycle of the computer and uh, shouted an alarm. Well, the, the computer uh, handled those things by uh, creating a, an interrupt and a restart and taking that task and putting it to the side. Uh, and uh, it uh, allowed the, the primary task like uh, thrust vector control to continue on, attitude control to continue on, but it had the, these tasks building up and it, it just uh, finally uh, say, I, I quit these tasks and he throws them away and starts working a new set. Uh, but it was a very efficient way of handling something that was flight critical and uh, still continuing the mission. Let me, Mr. Hearn, we have one more comment from Mr. Travis. Yeah, I, when we get into computers, let me just say that when I talk about 64K machines, those were strictly the machines that were at the remote sites. We did have large mainframe computers in the Mission Control Center that were processing the data and providing the displays for the, the mission. But I, I'm concerned that if we had today's technology, we would have made the mission too damn complex. And with, with that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our session today. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's been a real honor for me to be part of these uh, sessions, to, to sit, as I said, with the icons of, of uh, NASA from the 1960s, uh, people that inspired me and perhaps others to, to pursue a career in the sciences and technology. Thank you very much for being here today. Please enjoy the rest of your day here, and please exit to the right. <laughs>